say good morning and extend a welcome to each one. Thank you for coming on this beautiful morning. Let's pray. Kind Heavenly Father, as we pause before you again, we thank you for blessing us with this beautiful morning. Thank you for this opportunity to again gather in this way. We think of those that can't be here, gathered here with us. We just ask you to bless them where they are and provide for their needs, give them strength. And uh, we think of those that are leading out this morning in this service. We pray that you would provide for them as well and give them courage and strength for their responsibilities. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have three songs, and then I believe Lee will have the devotions. Good morning. Hymns of the Church, number 43. Number 43, this is the day the Lord hath made. Number 97. <clears throat> All this you care to me stand. <clears throat> Number 97. Praise the Lord the Almighty.
number 145. Number 145, God is love, his mercy brightens. morning. This morning you can turn Proverbs. We'll be looking at Proverbs chapter 4. Now if I were to have favorites, and favorites aren't always a good thing, but out of the books of the Bible, Proverbs would be one of the top of the list for me. And if I were to have favorite chapters in Proverbs, chapter 4 would be, again, near the top of the list. I can't say it would be at the top necessarily, but one thing I enjoy about this chapter is the fact that the writer here states things very clearly and very straightforward. Um, we as humans tend to be pretty complex people, and I always like when things are straightforward and easy to understand, and you can take them at face value. And a lot of what he has here in chapter 4 is very clear. It's, there's not a lot of um, deviation or room for, you know, interpretation or whatever. Um, I mean, obviously, all scripture, there's some interpretation. Uh, this morning, I chose to pick out just a few verses. We're going to begin at verse 14 and read 14 through 19. Drop in right in the middle of the chapter here says, enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked as is is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. If we were to take the book of Proverbs and sum it up in one word, or what the focus of the book of Proverbs is, what would that word be? Wisdom. That's right where my mind went. And here at the beginning of the chapter, he talks a lot about wisdom. Um, making sure we get wisdom, with our wisdom, get understanding before these verses. And then right in the middle of the chapter here, he drops this warning, and he says, enter not into the path of the wicked. Don't go in his way. Don't do it. Um, it's not worth doing. I'd like to think a little bit about warnings this morning, and that's where my mind was going in preparation for this morning. 
Um, why do we have warnings? What are warnings for? We see warnings all around us. Um, a saw will have a warning showing fingers chopped off if you misuse it. Extension cords, all of them come with a label and with a whole list of warnings warning you about being shocked, misusing it. Pill bottles, they have so many warnings on the back that they're in such small print they're hard to read. And even worse yet is sprays. If you buy sprays for your lawn or for insects, you name it, oftentimes they'll have a little pamphlet that you open up off the bottle, a little sticky thing you peel back, and there's a whole list of warnings and, and uses for that spray. But why? Why all these warnings? Any thoughts? Correct. You nailed it. The danger is what I'm after. Warnings are there to protect us from danger. Um, a lot of companies maybe don't care so much about each individual person so much as protecting themselves, but there's always a danger, and that's why we have the warning. Nowadays, we have so many warnings that we tend to not even think twice about them. Um, most times we probably don't even read them. We see signs along the road. How many of you took notice of at least one sign along the way here? Probably most of us, right? But how many of us can say we saw all the signs? Probably none of us um, along our path. In fact, interestingly enough, there's an intersection on the way to church here. There's two of them that have double stop signs, one on each side of the road. And my wife said the one time, she's like, yeah, she didn't notice till the other day. She, I think she missed the stop sign. I shouldn't say for sure, but she didn't notice that there's double ones on that intersection. I said, yeah, there is on the next one, too. No, there's not. And yeah, sure enough, there is. <laughs> so anyhow, um, we see so many signs and so many warnings that we don't even give a second thought to them. Um, what about when we buy a product? Most every product we buy, if it has plastic or any such Thing, and it usually has a warning about causing cancer in some certain state out west. Um, we've all seen that one, and we, we don't even pay attention to it. You know, it doesn't even concern us anymore because there's so many warnings. Where I'm going with this is what are we doing with the warnings we see in God's word here? We have warnings on skillets that warn us that this skillet may become hot. No doubt. Um, other comical ones include like a child's neck pillow saying, keep this product away from infants and children. It's like, seriously. Um, we tend not to even believe them or not even listen to them. We don't even um, take their advice because... They don't make sense. It, it's, it's just doing there to protect the manufacturer and keep us from suing them, right? Is that what God's warnings are there for us for? Is he concerned about us taking advantage of him? I think not. God warns us of danger because he cares about us. He cares. He loves us. He wants the best for us. Same as when we warn our children of something that we don't want them to be hurt by. The warning here in today's reading, enter not into the path of the wicked. Don't do it. Don't go there. Verse 15, avoid it. Pass not by it even. Don't even go close to it. Turn from it and pass away. Go the opposite way is what he's telling us. Why? Because they sleep not in verse 16, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. We have an adversary. We have an enemy who is pursuing us. He's chasing us. And the warning here in Proverbs is to run from it, to flee from it, to recognize that he is pursuing us. It's not an accidental error. He is after our soul. It's a valid warning. It's a warning that if we don't heed, we will be trapped. It's not a question. 
if we don't listen to it, it will affect us. There's a lot of warnings that we can disobey or not adhere to, and there's likely no harm. Um, every once in a while, someone gets nabbed by one, and think of the warning about cancer. You know, every once in a while, someone does get cancer, and it does does affect us. But a lot of people go through life and never get it, never get hurt. Um, the warning sign on the road of a curve ahead, there's some people that take them at full speed and make it fine. And the next person doesn't. The warning here in Proverbs, if we don't adhere to the warning, we will fall. There's no question. Um, if we enter into the path of the wicked, it will affect us. And we have the result in verse 19. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. We will stumble. We will be in darkness if we don't adhere the warning. What are we doing with warnings? Um, it can become easy to look at a Sunday school lesson like today's and look at all the, the stuff and think it's out there. Um, as you're studying today, it's easy to look at other church groups even and say, well, yeah, we can see it in their group. And, you know, it's, it doesn't really affect us, right? Uh, we don't need to worry about it. So we become callous to the fact that these things do exist and they are real. Um, just like warning labels that we tear off a product before we use, never even opening or looking at the label. We just tear them off and use the product. And we can tend to do that with lessons like today's Sunday school lesson. But let's be alert, let's be aware. These things do tend to creep into our midst. Um, we can tend to forget that our adversary is pursuing us. It's not just a warning label. He is actually chasing or pursuing us as a church. What will we do with the warnings God gives us? Let's kneel for prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Lee, for giving us those thoughts and those illustrations. Very good, very good thing to think about warnings. It's time for Sunday school. The youth and intermediate classes can be dismissed. Juniors. Primary. And preschool. And you adults can be dismissed as well.
for us this morning is to leave us to live. Having just discussed the scriptures and true prophecy, Peter turns to false prophets and warns of their tactics. Of their tactics. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to his priests and spirits. The focus to follow, faithfully follow the teachings of our Lord, finding deliverance from false teachings and false teachers. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for making it clear in your word that there are many consequences to following the way of the wicked. And thank you that we know from your word that you don't waste ink, you don't waste time giving needless warnings or warnings that don't have any use or application for us. You are all knowing, you know exactly what the outcome is for each way of life. And you know what the danger is. Thank you for warning us against it. Can we pay attention, heed that warning, not only today, but for the rest of our lives. Be with Caleb as he leads out, able him to speak and think clearly and be able to direct our conversation your interaction in a way that glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I guess we won't read the verses this morning. So, yeah, we'll just go right into it. Any thoughts on the first section? says, even as there shall be false teachers among you. And another translation has, just as there will be false teachers among you. So it's not, it's not an if. It's when. Yeah. <laughs> what? What motivates a person to become a false teacher? Verse 3 says covetousness. And I suppose you could covet numerous things, whether it's prestige or... It says they make merchandise, so I don't know, I guess. Maybe it's through the offering. Yeah. I'm just saying there's there's various reasons, I guess, why people tend to you know, succumb to that. Or maybe that was their goal from the start. Yeah. Rebellion. Verse 10, they despise government or authority. Pride, presumptuous, and self will. What kind of way can we say that? How do we detect the false teaching? Detect it. How do we detect it? Yes. Yes, yeah, that's a good question. We need, to know the, we need to know the real thing, don't we? Sometimes they can talk so good. They, they, they talk really good, but yet they, if, you, if you look at their lives, they don't know that. Mm -hmm. I think some of them are deceived themselves. They, they think they're right. <clears throat> Verse 12, they speak evil of the things that they understand not. So is it more the motive, their motive, than what their 
they're actually saying or what actually what actually is it? Sounds so good. So the words, so not always, but sometimes the words can be right. Yeah. But if you look at their lives, they're not right. Or it's not lining up to scripture or whatever. So I was just curious, like, so <clears throat> I don't it's probably not all the time. Like Jordan said, like, some are deceived, don't yeah. know. So, I, mean, I don't think it's one in a certain way. It was just, it's a thought I had. It's like, well, yeah, it could be, even though they're looking. Are saying right and all that, but if their motive is wrong, all it takes for their motive to be wrong. Sometimes, as well, the problem is not necessarily what they do say, the problem is mostly what they do not say. Sometimes they will talk about, for example, God is love and God loves you. And that's all they say. That's what they harp on. That's what they dwell on. And they forget or ignore or deny that God is also holy. Which, if you don't also teach that God is holy, <clears throat> doesn't that cheapen His love? of scripture like there's so many scriptures that can be interpreted a certain way but when you balance them with other scriptures for example um, eternal security or whatever like just because one portion of scripture makes it sound like I mean just they use that one portion of scripture to support their idea that once saved always saved and not balancing with, with other scripture. And I, I'm not just pointing fingers at anyone, I'm just saying you, if you take a portion of scripture and that's what you build your whole thesis around and you don't balance it out and look at the whole scripture, you tend to get a very biased viewpoint. And so it makes it really tough because they will use scripture oftentimes to support their, their uh, ideas. Or what they're trying to promote. Yeah, you have mostly truth, maybe, but just a little bit of, with a little twist or something. So it sounds good, mostly, <coughs> but then it's a little hard to pick out what isn't right. Unless we know the truth. Clearly. And in most areas of dis differences and disagreements, Neither side is immune to being lopsided. Yeah, anyone else. <laughs> right, that's a good point. That it almost enters in. <clears throat> I think a true teacher is willing to be taught. He's open to truth. I just read recently about, I think it was a quote, it said he was an eloquent speaker, but he was only teaching about people of John. Mm -hmm. And so the other apostles were able to take him in further teaching, and then he was more useful. I think we're open to the input of other believers, and we don't go off on this ten tangent of our own mm -hmm. and just promote our train of thought. We need to do balance. <clears throat> so if we're, if we're self-willed or selfish, then it's going to be hard accept somebody else. So that's a real that's sign. It's a real sign. Yeah, it's a some good sign. It's a sign that we yeah, maybe maybe they are a false teacher. So they won't accept the direction.
seems like false teachers tend to be, I would say they're, if you look at their life, they're probably selfish. I mean, if they're deceived, then maybe, I mean, maybe they would still be selfish, I'm not sure, but like, if you're deceived, I think you're right, so, I guess it can be a little hard to know how to, yeah, how to discern what's right, which, yeah, we can always ask God for wisdom, and we study the Bible. Maybe, maybe um, we should ask how how can we keep from becoming selfish? Because it seems like that's what leads to being a false teacher. I'd say one to start is just be open, be willing to accept, like Maynard said, because when you get stuck in your rut, <clears throat> that rut gets bigger, and you can. Yeah. I guess I have to wonder how some of <clears throat> their setting was different than ours, I guess. I mean, today we have more, somewhat, not, we're not closed church groups, but I mean, we have a given church group. And, so we don't just have people wandering by and come in and try to teach and so it says, well, it says they're going to rise from among them too. But so where did they have access to all these false doctrines? But then I think, you know, we have access to just about anything you want to hear today. Yeah. And I think it's where it comes back to, it says know them that minister among you. If you don't know the people, be careful about what you hear. I mean, take it to the scripture and, and examine it, compare it with scripture. Don't just run with everything that you hear. <clears throat> I always say time will give time will bring out the honesty if you're willing to listen to somebody and give them a little time the truth will come out in every case yeah what's in the heart comes out so you wait long enough to see it <clears throat> Jesus compared false teachers to wolves in sheep's clothing and it, it's my understanding that oftentimes shepherds would wear wool. Which kind of makes sense because it, they raise the sheep and it, it would provide a, a handy source of clothing. But also it would help the sheep be more comfortable with the shepherd. Not that, not that it, the shepherd would necessarily act like a sheep, but it would look like a sheep, and maybe smell like a sheep, and so on. Um, but in that case, sometimes the false teachers are those who are shepherds of the flock, those who are the leaders. Not the only case, but sometimes that's where the problem begins. Already been mentioned, they often use 
what sounds like good terminology, good words, or uh, they talk about the same subjects, you could say. But sometimes what they mean by the words they use is different than what we would understand it to mean. Or as, as mentioned before too, that sometimes they leave out certain things. And so what they say still sounds good, but they just don't get around to, to that balance. Sit there and sit on one thing, you know, it's brought up earlier about the love of God, whatever you want to put in there, they harp on. But then when you, when they get asked some personal things, kind of like the rich young ruler, there, you know, he did everything right, but he couldn't give up his stuff and give it to the poor. And then you ask them about, you know, put in there whatever, just a personal thing, and they, they wilt like it because they. That's an area they don't want to talk about. I think a true believer, we want to see it all. The question was asked earlier about how to detect a false teacher. Maybe we should talk about that a little more. In verse 1 there it says about even denying the Lord that bought them. So maybe that's one way. They deny that the Lord is, yeah, that Jesus is God or something like that, then we know that they're false. <clears throat> what maybe what's the ways that we deny Jesus? Maybe it comes closer home than you think. Maybe we wouldn't say that God's not Jesus or Jesus isn't God. But what are other ways? There might be some I think there's some other ways that we might do the same thing. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Any way that we yield or present our members to the flesh instead of to the spirit, so that would include any sin, any area of disobedience in God's word. So living in sin, basically, any sin. There's one way we could deny Jesus.
says just lot, which just means righteous. And so it seems he still believed God. And it was somewhere in the Bible it says about how they, their faith is counted to them for righteousness. So he had faith. And yeah, God honored that. I just thought that was kind of interesting. That, <coughs> Well, I think most of the time, I picture Lot as living in Abraham's shadow. Abraham was his uncle, it seemed like. When Lot needed help, Abraham delivered me. Went after him, rescued him, yeah. and just kind of like in his, like I say, in his shadow. But obviously, Lot was a man of faith, but he made some wrong, yeah. less than perfect choices. And it affected his family. Yeah, I, I mean, when we put materialism above, spiritual needs of our family, it tends to have consequences, and I did in lots of them, yeah. pretty serious ones. But I thought too, I told my wife, I said, it's probably good that we're not called to judge people because we're, we classify a lot for the choices that he made. Right. Peter gave him all the benefit of the doubt. And I think we can take a lesson from that as well. We're not called to judge people, and we don't determine their eternal destiny, God does. Right. But Peter gave him, I mean, obviously Peter had grounds for doing that. Yeah. When it comes to warning, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to warnings, what about Lot's wife? Don't look back. She did and instantly became a pillar of salt, right? Yeah. He meant what he said. Judgment's sure. I do like verse 9. It says, Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. That should be a comfort. That's a promise. I mean, we can, we can be delivered from our temptations. God knows how to. Another interesting thing about Lot is back in Genesis 19. The men of Sodom said that this foreigner came in and keeps acting as a judge over us. So even even in his compromised materialistic state, there was something different about Lot that they noticed and resented. And Lot did believe that the judgment was certain because he was afraid that it would overtake him before he got to the mountains and he asked that that one smaller city be spared. He believed it was going to happen. Yeah. Another thing from Genesis, speaking about balance, I'll read a couple of verses out of the NIV about the flood. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So don't forget, it's not an unfeeling judgment. It's not an emotionless sentencing. Well, and it, and yeah. So Lot was there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe he was kind of their prophet, or 
I don't know what word you want to use. Maybe he was the person there to make them think a little bit that if they are doing wrong, then they should change. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they, if they thought he was a judge, they were probably feeling convicted or something. They didn't like something about it. It may have been like a conscience, a reminder of their evil deeds. Hey. <clears throat> So maybe so that's yeah. God's judgment is perfect, so they were without excuse if you probably say that yeah. It's not that they didn't have a chance or someone in the Lord there's one phrase that in the commentary that popped up to me and that's the statement, the devil is never more satanic than when he carries a Bible. And I think that's where, um, for where we're at today. I really think that's probably one of one of the uh, biggest uh, challenges I don't know we face today. I could be wrong, but there's a there's a lot of um, good ministries and stuff that you can listen to and follow and all that, but they comp they compromise, you know. They, they don't take a stand against divorce or marriage or whatever it might be. And I just have to think about that lately. Is, you know, I know that that is wrong, um, but what about my uh, the children get older? Would they, would they have that decisiveness? You know what I'm saying? Is, they have a lot of good stuff and we can appreciate what they're doing, but yet if they're not totally following the gospel, I, I don't know, I think somebody better be pretty careful about it. Yeah. And it seems like there's a lot of companies too that kind of like to do the same things. They throw scripture into it, they hook the Anabaptist type people, and, and the way they go about it is not a godly way. That might be just my opinion. Yeah, I mean, you could easily use something that's spiritual or whatever just to get people to follow you or yeah, use it to make money or something. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, let's, let's move into the second section. Any thoughts on that section? Submission are built into the fabric of human life. It's the way God designed it to be. Our flesh doesn't like that, and our flesh resists that. But that's the way it is. Would that be another way to detect a false teacher if they won't come under authority? If they talk bad about leadership? That kind of thing? I'd say that's not somebody we want to follow. It would be dangerous to follow somebody like that. It doesn't bring it out so much here in this passage, but could there be another way in which authority is belittled or despised or not taken seriously and that it's abused? Misuse your authority. Yeah. <laughs> oh, talk, I said about how the false teachers might promise pleasant things or whatever, promise good things. 
um, verse, verse 13. I mean, it is probably true that they, what they promise may come to pass actually sometimes. I mean, it's not like there is no reward for what they teach me. Um, here and now, there is probably a reward for some of the things that if you follow after them. You may make more money, you may, um, you might have an easy life. But in verse 13 it says, shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. There's a reward for following after that. Eventually there will be a judgment, which we talked about. Verse 14 it says that cannot cease from sin. In Romans it talks about how the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed it can be. The flesh simply cannot obey God's law. Says, 19 says about they promised them liberty. So yeah, they, that's another promise, or that is a promise that they might give you is that freedom. But is that true freedom? Doing whatever you please. Um, we're a servitor, as we do. We're gonna go after pleasures, sin. We're a servant to sin. It ain't freedom. It's bondage. Only in Jesus. Isn't followers of a false prophet always confused? I mean, if you look at, just look at our government. They promise this and they promise that. And I mean, you know how well it works. Yeah. Everybody that listens to them is about as confused and about as angry. And, yeah. and too often I think that you see that in, in leadership in churches or put whatever you want in there. If the leader ain't doing the right thing, the sheep are about like scattered chickens. Mm. And they're confused. And I think that's another sign to walk. To determine a false problem. That last section also talks about um, the idea that it falls back in the scene. Their end can be worse than the beginning, or worse than even before. Um, you know, if you've known God and you turn away from that, it seems like you end up more depraved than you were before. So yeah, that's not, it's not a good, turning, turning away from God because it's harder, whatever is not going to be better for you in the end. And I have to think about all these, well, what the, out of norm and all that stuff just years ago, but I can think pretty far back in the day. It was spiritually operated and it was real good, but it seemed like the last president, everything is ungodly. It's no wonder that we are in the mess of the way we are. Leaders are. Yeah. That's why we go from God to worship goods. All right, thank you, Paul, for your help.
brings our Sunday school hour to a close. Thank you again, teachers, for your time and effort. Um, I believe there's a couple new things on the bulletin board, if that interests you, some things from Deeper Life. Um, you can take a look at that if you remember. We'll ask for three songs, and then we'll turn the time over to the ministry. Number 585. Number 585, follow the path of Jesus. Number 520, all those who care to may stand. Number 520, day by day.
may be seated. And then right across the page, number 521. Number 521, be still and know. morning. Welcome to the service here this morning. Welcome visitors. A bright and beautiful Sunday morning. I don't know if it ever gets as lush as it is currently. Maybe in August we'll try and remember back what it was like when we had rain. Yeah, it's good to be back in our normal setting this morning for worship service. And this brings us to our time of our worship hour. A few announcements. Most of us remember that Randy and Charla left us on Wednesday. Wednesday morning they flew out. By Wednesday night, Wednesday evening, I got a message and a picture of them in their new home. Now what happened between those two times is a story I am sure. They did arrive safely. Randy says, with delayed flights and lots of hassle at the immigrations. So welcome to Nicaragua, right? So I trust it went uphill from there, or downhill, or whatever you want to call that they had uh, a good week. Willis's are in Kansas visiting family this morning. Let's remember to pray for Vacation Bible School. So this announcement is to remind us to invite children and then bring children and let them enjoy a week of Bible School. It's an opportunity to reach out in the communities that we are part of. Notice Larry and Sharon's baby arrived. So they are the happy parents of Ashley Renee. So we can pray for them also and their New responsibilities. Seems like these are coming quite, quite frequently, right? A 
give you a little update on Ray. We went to visit him Tuesday night. He had a, another round of chemotherapy on Tuesday, and um, he was doing better than he had been the weekend prior. So he had a low, low weekend last weekend. So they were intending to go to Michigan to, this weekend. So continue to pray for his healing. There's been a good update. Um, the tests prove and show that the tumor is shrinking. So that is cause to rejoice <clears throat> and praise the Lord. God bless each of you groups as you get together tonight, hospitality night, individual homes. Sounds like an enjoyable time. That is how we get to know each other better. Looking forward to it. Does anybody have any announcements that they want to make this morning? Is up for men's camping. So. Sign up sheet for men's camping. So sign up if you plan to attend. All right, birthdays this morning. We have a couple birthdays today. We have Melody Lead. Happy birthday. And we have Denver Steiner with a birthday today. So happy birthday, Denver. And then Brielle Geyser celebrates her birthday tomorrow in Nicaragua. So happy birthday, Brielle. The offering this morning is for the general fund, so the uh, ushers can come forward. Yeah, this is for the building fund again. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the beauty of the day, the sunshine, for meeting with us here. Thank you for each and every one that is here. An interesting hearing a word of the Lord again. We ask that you administer to our needs. We thank you for providing for us the way that you do and that we can share in this way. May you bless the building of this, the, the, the building here as we maintain it. May we be a light and a testimony in the community here. We thank you for providing a place for us to meet. It is your work. May we go forth from this place and, and be a beacon. May you just bless the gift and the giver. It's, for your honor, your glory, pray for the message this morning that you would bless Brother Bert, give him a message to preach, make speaking easy, pray that it would fall on attentive ears and uh, sensitive hearts, that you would meet the needs of the hour that are here today. We are needy people seeking a word of the Lord. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Greetings in Jesus' name. Trust you have been blessed already, and you are trusting in Jesus as we have sung. Turn with me to Romans chapter, uh, chapter 8. I have been studying this subject for a while, and... As God does, the Sunday school lesson and the message go hand in hand or maybe even overlap. But here in Romans 8 is where I want to begin. There is there now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That is not the title, but that is the theme. Walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, 
God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There it is again, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There you have contrast. Neutral you cannot be. What will you do with Jesus? We cannot be neutral. Here it is, the contrast. Carnally minded is death, but the spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And as we go through this, Subject this morning, it will become clear we cannot grow in Christ if we have not the Spirit of God in us. This is what it says. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We are not part of the kingdom of God if we have not the Spirit of Christ in us. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. We are made alive. We are raised up just as Christ was raised up. And our mortal bodies are made alive by the spirit that dwelleth in us. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. No servant can serve two masters on the overhead. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot do both. Neutral, we cannot be. I don't know if this is a good title or not, but this is where I want to spring off of, the Overton window. Maybe some of you have heard of the Overton window. It is a political term. And those in, in the back might not be able to read those words. But the Overton window is simply a window of... Um, well, let me say it this way. Joseph Overton, the American policy analyst, proposed that an idea's political viability depends mainly on whether it falls within this range. So this is a range where politicians work in when they create policy. Uh, in the center there, you see policy then popular, sensible, acceptable, radical, unthinkable. So the further you get to the edge of the window and outside of the window is less likely when a, that a policy will be accepted. According to Overton, the window frames the range of policies that a politician can recommend without appearing too extreme to gain or to keep his public office, given the current climate of public opinion. The definition literally is the spectrum of ideas on public policy and social issues considered acceptable by the general policy. So that is the Overton window. Joseph Overton introduced it, and it was further developed by his colleague, Joseph Lehman, after Overton's death. So the question could be asked, what if I want to advance a policy? If I propose a policy, what, what would be the approach to advance this policy? What if that policy falls outside of the window and would fall into the radical and the unthinkable? Propose policy solutions within the window in the direction of the desired outcome. Don't propose the radical but, or the unthinkable, but propose something that would be sensible and possibly acceptable, and that will move the window towards where you want to be. 
the window can slowly be moved and what is considered radical now will eventually move into the window frame. Even the unthinkable may move into the window frame. Major changes have a very low chance of acceptance and adoption. But even the crazy ideas will eventually become not so crazy and possibly even accepted. Slow changes will be accepted, sometimes even unawares that we are accepting it. So that ha having said that, concerning the Overton window, I want to suggest that we have a window in our spiritual journey as well. And allow me to propose that we are in a window, and I'm, I'm just using these words, and you could argue maybe the uh, progression of them, but I'm using these words for an example. And let's say we are standing on truth right in the center. Um, along with truth, there's trustworthy, and then integrity, and sound speech. But while I'm standing on truth, I'm still okay with stretching the truth a little bit or maybe using a white lie, or I find myself gossiping. So, let's see, we cannot stay neutral, so we move one way or the other. So, what does the direction of degeneration look like? So, I move the window, and now sound speech is outside of the window, and deceit came in. When I was... I was okay with stretching the truth and a white lie and gossiping, but now I'm okay with literally deceiving someone. Uh, maybe um, pretending or not giving the whole truth or allowing to give someone a false impression. Another step. I had accepted deceiving someone or leaving a false impression, but now... I'm okay with saying an outright, outright lie. And it keeps moving. Now truth is out of the frame, and now evil thoughts continually in my heart and in my mind. The thoughts of the wicked are abomination to the Lord, according to Proverbs 15, 26. Let's go back to the same frame, and let's do it again and progress. Neutral we cannot be. We'll either decline or progress. Let, truth is in the center, and we'll keep going. Gracious words, so you're moving towards holiness and righteousness. Gossip is outside of the frame now, and gracious words come in. Rather than using my speech to slander or to gossip about someone, now gracious words are coming in to the frame. All the bad moves out, and truth is in, and our language is sanctified. All evil speaking is gone. The words are only true, only blessing, kind and sweet. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. I also did it with another word, using the word love. And let's go through this also in the same way. De with, I have love in my heart, but there are some people that I do avoid. I have love. I embrace God. I embrace my fellow men. I cherish them. I have an affection for them. In fact, it's a deep affection. But there's some that I avoid. There's some that I dislike. And maybe even one or so that I can't tolerate. Moving in that, that direction, now rather than not tolerating, uh, I actually despise some people and you keep moving, love moves out and hate moves in. Love and hate cannot be in the same frame. See how slowly over time what is outside comes in and what is inside leaves. Let's do this on the progression. 
we do love, but we have a lot of room to grow. And as we grow, we have a deeper love. And now we have a passion for God and for fellow man. And we have a deeper communion, a deeper fellowship. Dislike has disappeared out of the frame. And we grow into the holy likeness of Christ. Being sanctified unto perfection. We live in a frame. We have a reference point. Neutral we cannot be. We also have a limited view of, of life. We will always see life from the center of the window in both directions. And our reference point will move. The outside will come in and the inside will move out. Depends on what direction we are. Yesterday we were playing softball at the school picnic. One of the dads mentioned that there's so many close calls at first base. Nobody else made a comment on it, but let's imagine that someone would have suggested, well, if there's so many close calls, let's move the base a step closer to eliminate those f close calls. What did we just do? Did we get rid of the close calls? No. Now what, is an e what used to be an easy out becomes the close calls now, right? That is the same illustration that we have with this frame that we look through. Sim similar illustration concerning the frog in the boiling water, and I found it interesting. Wikipedia said that it is a fable. He said, Wikipedia said, use it as an illustration, but it's not factual. If you, if the, the story goes, if you put a frog in boiling or hot water, the frog will jump out. If you put a frog in war, in uh, room temperature water, and heat it up slowly, the frog will stay and die. So I did not try it, but in the reading that I did, it said that's false. It said actually frogs would jump out if the water gets too hot. And also it said if the water is boiling and you put frog in, they, don't, they, they die immediately. So I've not tried it, and I'm not going to try it. But think about the lesson. Things that slowly come in we may even be unaware of the change in environment and the change in our life. Introducing a radical idea from outside that frame is not likely to be accepted by us. Right? If someone introduces a radical idea, we will not accept it. But how many times the environment changes very slowly and we accept it? There are many illustrations in the political world, and I could point out a number of them in the spiritual realm as well, that we accept things that not so long ago would have been an easy out. There's some examples in the Bible. Think about Lot. Lot was in our Sunday school lesson as well. What were his thoughts when he stood on that mountain and he chose the plains for his herd and his tents? What, was he, what were his thoughts? Do you, could we imagine that Lot was standing there and he was thinking the end, that my goal is to sit on the council of Sodom? Or do you think he just saw the plains and thought, this is a good life for me, I'm going to move down and enjoy life. And he never imagined himself to be in the city, much less on the city council. But that day he made a decision. 
that day he made a choice, and that choice affected him in ways that I don't think he thought of. The Bible says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He set a direction. Absalom. Absalom was in trouble. He was banned from Jerusalem. He couldn't see his father David. Finally, he pled and his father David invited him to Jerusalem. And I am imagining that the things that went through his mind were not, I am going to dethrone my father and I am going to have that, uh, that position or that role. But little by little, the choices that Absalom made moved that frame and he led a rebellion and he claimed the throne. The small decisions that he made had direction and he ended up chasing his father out of Jerusalem. I was blessed by the reading in Proverbs, Solomon in all his wisdom. Think about Solomon, the wisest man. And if you read his story, do you think he saw the end from the beginning when he started making political moves and marrying the heathen women that he did? Maybe he would not have done that if he would have known that that frame is moving and where he's going to end up. Marrying those heathen women took him down, took him the wrong way. Judas comes to mind. When Judas became a disciple of Jesus, I do not believe the small decisions that he made that he thought the end result will be that I will betray Jesus. And I was thinking of the prodigal son as well when he asked, when he asked for uh, his inheritance. Father, give me my inheritance. What if he could have seen the pig pen when he asked for the inheritance? What can we learn from this that every decision we make will move that window and we will accept and do things that we have not done, that were an easy out, that were radical and unacceptable, but later they s drift in and become a part of us and we embrace it or accept it. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Again, all our decisions have direction. For the born again children of God, the window will move towards God. The window will move towards holiness. Walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Those who are saved will view life differently. Those who are safe will make decisions accordingly. They will do things differently as well. Again, what was inside the frame, what was acceptable, but not good, will move out, and what we weren't reaching will move in. Holiness and victory will move into the frame. Either we're moving towards God or we're moving away from Him. Moving towards holiness or moving towards worldliness. I'm going to invite you to reflect a little bit. Don't look at your neighbor, but let's reflect a little bit. Where were we a year ago? Has anything changed in our perspective or in our practice or in our acceptance of things from a year ago? Probably most of us could identify a few things, right? Was it towards the good or was it towards the bad? What about three years ago? 
or five years ago? How do we view life or things now that we didn't? Are we getting callous to things that are influencing us towards worldliness and, and um, selfishness? Well, selfishness is worldliness. Which direction am I going? Am I getting comfortable with those things that I was not comfortable with five years ago? What was, a, what was an easy out is now debatable for me. Maybe I noticed the environment. Maybe I don't. Maybe I noticed the change. Maybe I don't. I, w- I would like to invite us to be observant and to be serious about the direction that that frame is moving. Turn with me to Ephesians 2. A call to holiness, the fruit of salvation. Ephesians 2, a call to holiness, the fruit of salvation. And you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The first three verses there is who we were before God saved us through the blood of Jesus. We were on our way down. We were like others. By nature, we were the children of wrath. We were fulfilling the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's who we were. But God, in verse 4, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through through Christ Jesus. For by grace ye are saved. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So many times I read these verses and I claim verses 8 and 9. And they are true and they are for us to claim. Paul has a way with words here. Rich in mercy and exceeding great riches of his grace. But for God, we would be hopeless and eternally lost. By grace, through faith, it is a gift that we are saved. Jesus healed people and he says, according to your faith, be it unto you. Faith is believing that God will not condemn us in our sin. Faith is believing that we can be cleansed from our sin and we can rise above sin, the practice of sin. Who can explain salvation? How one man dies and the blood of that one man can cleanse another man from sin. By faith are you saved. Even if we can't explain it, we can believe it because God said it and he did it. I want to emphasize, verse 8 says, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not in our own efforts, not our own deeds. That word works is literally just that, works, its deeds, its acts, its labor. We can't get away from that word. That's what the Bible uses, and that's what it means, works. 
but it says that we are not saved by works. But so many times I stop there. Did, did you ever notice verse 10? What are we saved for? It says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So I just got done emphasizing that works doesn't save us. Now here it says that um, that's our responsibility. Good works is our responsibility. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. It's the very same word. But we are his workmanship. We are his product. We are his fabric in Christ Jesus unto good works. Created so that we should walk in them. That's what it says. Ordained that ye should walk in them. You may say that I'm promoting a works religion. Actually, I am. I am promoting a works religion. It's not the salvation the works by salvation, but I am promoting good works. Call it what we want. We can call it results or fruit or um, labors. The Bible calls it work. Titus 2 are some more verses that have blessed me when I came across these. Turn with me to Titus 2. I'm going to be referencing a number of verses here. We are created unto good works. Yes, we are saved unto good works. So the result or the evidence of being saved is what it's talking about. Titus 2 verses 11 and 12 says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Here again, we see that the grace of God is that what brings salvation. But what does it do? What does it do? What does it do? It teaches us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So that's why we're saved. We are saved and it's teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldliness, but we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. That is our mandate. That is what we're asked to do. Verse 14 calls us peculiar people. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. We're peculiar people, but we're zealous of good works because that we're saved is why we are zealous of good works. We're not doing the good works to be saved according to Scripture. Verse 7, In all things showing themselves a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. It's amazing. I'm just touching a few verses that talk about the results of salvation, the fruit of salvation. It says, showing thyself a pattern of good works. When we are saved, that is our mandate. Chapter 3, verse 8. This is a faithful saying that these things I will, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. They which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. That's what it's asking us to do. These things are good and profitable unto men. Maintain, careful to maintain, affirm constantly. Titus was constantly confirming those that believe in God to maintain good works. That is what I want to do as well. Encourage us to live in godliness and in holiness Verse 14 of the same chapter, and let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they may not, they may be not unfruitful. Talking about fruit, again, I want to make it clear, we do not earn our salvation, but good works is a result of salvation. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy 
he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We are not saved by the works of righteousness, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. James makes it clear. Faith without works is dead. True faith in God will result in works of righteousness. Let me say that again. James makes it clear that faith without works is not faith. It's dead. To the overhead again. I don't have any bad words up here this time. A person may seek and may feast on the milk of the word and then the meat of the word and then comes love, joy, peace, gentleness, faith, holiness and outside of the frame is completion and perfection. That is what we are after. I want our spiritual window to move towards holiness, to move towards perfection. That is what God desires of us. What we once accepted, we reject, and we grow in grace. What was inside the frame is now outside the frame, and we're, what is outside the frame at the top is now coming into the frame. Adultery is wrong. Now even to look upon a woman to lust after her is outside of the frame. To murder, to kill someone is wrong. To hate someone is wrong, but now even to be angry at someone is outside of the frame. We do not accept it anymore. 2 Kings 19, verse 30, I found a, an interesting verse. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. The remnant of the house of Judah shall... I yet again take root downward and fruit upward. I want to camp on that. Let's put down our roots into the scripture and allow the fruit to grow upward. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, bearing fruit upward. Strengthening those things that which remain, putting root downward ever onward, ever upward, until we are translated from this life into the next. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which in heaven is perfect. Which is in heaven is perfect. Complete, full age. This is my commitment to you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Thank you for being here. Let's ever climb upward and onward, faithfully serving our Savior because he has saved us for that exact reason. Shall we have a song?
Thank, thank you for leading that song. Sitting here, I realize that was just scratching the surface. But we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. But sitting here, I was, I was thinking about that. 1 Corinthians 13 says, without love we are um, tingling symbols. So in other words, without salvation we can do all kinds of works that are good and it just is, it's just a noise. That's all it is. And then it also came to me that in Matthew 25 where there was separation from the, the sheep from the goats, neither one of them remembered the opportunities that they had. That is actually real for us. Being born again out of a heart of compassion, we just serve God. And it's not a check mark. It's not a list that we keep. All we do is we just allow the love of God to flow through us and the fruit will follow because there's many times that we can intentionally do a good work to be seen of men and it's just a, just a noise, just an empty symbol. So I want to encourage you, encourage us to walk in the Spirit and fulfill um, our calling. Thank you for being here, and I invite you to rise for a closing prayer. Trust you can have a blessed afternoon. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have had to be together, to look into your word. Lord, we recognize that there is nothing that we can do to be free from sin. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the cleansing blood of Jesus and for calling us unto yourself. Lord, because of that, we love you, and we want your spirit to have free reign in our hearts and our life. Pray that we can say no to the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and grow in, our, in grace and in our love for you, in our love for fellow men. Again, ask that you would give us a burden for the lost. Inspire us to fulfill your will in the corner of, the, of your kingdom where you have called us. Dismiss us with your blessing. Again, thank you for each one that is here and make us a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.